Hello everyone. My name is Dr. Bindusta Sabu. I am an associate professor at the Indian Institute of Science Education and Research at Tiruvannamdapuram. Today I am going to talk about the beautiful world of mathematics in physical sciences. Okay, so so what exactly is mathematics? So basically, I am taking this uh, definition from an article by uh, Eugen Wigner, who is a Nobel Prize winning physicist uh, in 1963. And this article's name is called uh, uh, The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics in Natural Sciences. So he defines mathematics as the science of skillful operations with concepts and rules specifically designed for this purpose. So basically mathematicians, they really don't care what your real world is. They define some rules which they call as axioms and they do operations with these rules and develop uh, new branches of mathematics. So most of the elementary mathematics that we know, uh, the rules and concepts involved in this elementary mathematics are intuitively coming from our experience with real world. For example, natural numbers, how we add them, subtract them, multiply them, these are all very intuitive notions. But once we go beyond elementary mathematics into advanced mathematics, we, we develop concepts and rules which sometimes appear very counterintuitive and a priori it would seem like you know they have nothing to do with uh, the real world. But it turns out that they are indeed very useful in explaining the real world around us. I would uh, give two examples to uh, basically try to say what I am saying. Okay, so first example I am going to use is uh, which is very familiar with uh, most of you. In fact, you must have learned in 18 years school and this is the Euclidean geometry. So, as you know, if you have studied uh, like if your 9th standard or 10th standard uh, mathematics syllabus, it is there, is uh, something called Euclidean geometry. Okay, so Euclidean geometry uh, follows from five postulates of Euclid. Okay, and using these five postulates, you can essentially do all the geometry on a plane, right? All planar geometry essentially follows from these five postulates of Euclid and these are, this is what is called Euclidean geometry. Okay, uh, it turns out that uh, you can uh, relax some of these postulates. Okay, so you can, uh, you can modify some of these postulates, you can remove some of these postulates and you can still consistently do geometry with the remaining postulates. Okay, and it turns out that two of the postulates of Euclid which if you uh, modify or relax, you get a new kind of geometry, which is called Riemannian geometry. And this Riemannian geometry is useful in uh, doing geometry on curved spaces. So earlier Euclidean geometry was useful in doing geometry on planar surfaces, but if you relax these uh, postulates of Euclid, you arrive at something called the Riemannian geometry which is useful for doing geometry on curved spaces, such as sphere. Okay. Still, so far we are in the real world. Okay. We are either doing geometries on the plane or on the sphere. And both in Euclidean and Riemannian geometry, okay, you need to define what a straight line is. Because if you look at Euclidean postulates, you know, uh, there are uh, definitions where you know, straight lines are used. So you need to arrive at this notion of straight line and to arrive at this notion of straight line you need to define what is the distance between two points. Okay, And whichever curve minimizes the distance between two points that is the definition of a straight line. Intuitively on plane we understand what a straight line is. Okay, But on curved surfaces as a sphere you need to define the notion of distance and any curve on the sphere which minimizes this distance will be the parallel of straight line on a sphere. It will be the analog of straight line on a sphere. Okay. So this notion of distance you have to 
incorporate in your Euclidean as well as Riemannian geometry. Now this distance in both Euclidean and Riemannian geometry satisfy two main properties. Okay. So one of the property is that distance between two distinct points has to be always positive or zero. And it can only be zero if these two distinct points are actually the same point. Otherwise it is always positive. Okay. And it needs to satisfy something called the triangle inequality. That means the distance between A to B and B to C, if you add them, it should always be greater than or equal to the distance between A and C. So these two properties has to be satisfied by this notion of distance. Okay. Now it turns out that you can relax one of these properties that this distance has to satisfy and you still arrive at a consistent description of geometry. And this is the demand that the distance has to be positive or zero. You, you remove that uh, postulate from your geometry. You can still do geometry consistently. And such geometries are called pseudo-Riemannian geometry. And in pseudo-Riemannian geometry, distance can be zero or even negative between two distinct points. It's very counterintuitive, right? Indeed it is. And a priori one might think that such geometries are useless. They have no use beyond abstract mathematical world. In physical real world, you don't have any such geometries. But it turns out that these geometries are actually useful in our physical real world. So I bring to your attention one of the biggest discoveries of 20th century, which is this Einstein's general theory of relativity. Okay. So Einstein's general theory of relativity talks about uh, gravity okay, and the properties of this force called gravity. Okay. And it is, it is an extension of Newtonian uh, theory of gravity and it is useful when you are dealing with particles which are moving at relativistic speeds. That means speed closer to the speed of light. Okay. Or you have, you have very strong gravitational field like that of black holes. Their Newtonian gravity won't be useful. You have to use this Einstein's general theory of relativity. And it turns out this pseudo Riemannian geometry, which we a priori thought that are useless beyond abstract mathematical world, these are actually useful for formulating Einstein's general theory of relativity. If you did not have this notion of pseudo Riemannian geometry, where the distance between two points was allowed to be negative and zero, you could not have formulated Einstein's general theory of relativity which is actually explaining the world around us, how gravity behaves in the world around us. This is one example. I, I give you another example. So you are all aware of real numbers, right? Real numbers are what, you know, you have uh, integers, there can be positive integers, negative integers, zero, there can be fractions or rational numbers, that can be even be irrational numbers like square root of 2 or pi. All these are real numbers. All these you can visualize in some way. Integers, of course, you can visualize. You have one apple or two apple or three apple or no apple. Okay. And fractions also you can visualize. You take a piece of cake, cut it into half. You have half you can visualize. Irrational numbers like square root of 2 also you can visualize. Right. You take a right angle triangle. Uh, with uh, the base and the perpendicular of unit length, then the hypotenuse has the length of square root of 2. That also you can visualize. Pi you can visualize. It's basically the ratio of the circumference to the diameter of the circle. So all real numbers you can visualize. They are there in our real world. You can perform addition with them, subtraction with them, multiplication with them. And they are all intuitively very clear. But here comes the twist. Mathematicians are not happy with just real numbers. So they introduce something called an imaginary number. What is this imaginary number? So you know that whenever you take square root, you can only take square roots of positive numbers. But mathematicians say, hey, what stops the, us from taking the square root of a negative number? So they take this quantity minus one and take the square root of that. Okay. 
Of course, you cannot visualize square root of minus 1 in real world. You cannot draw any, any triangle or any circle or any, anything to visualize square root of minus 1. So it's actually not a real number and they call it as an imaginary number. Even the denote use the symbol i to denote it. So this is an imaginary number. And they, and they define rules to add and multiply real numbers to this imaginary number. And they expand this number system of real numbers to incorporate all these numbers that can arise from the addition and subtraction and multiplication of real numbers with this imaginary number. And this whole number system is called complex numbers. Now you may think, okay, this is, this is weird, this is absurd, and perhaps it has no significance beyond the abstract mathematical world. I mean, uh, what can be its significance? We, we cannot see imaginary numbers. Now here let me bring to your attention another biggest discovery of 20th century, which is quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is a framework which is necessary for understanding the physics of the small world, the physics of subatomic world, how electrons, protons, all these smaller particles, subatomic particles, how they behave. Okay. Quantum mechanics is a framework to understand that. You cannot use Newtonian mechanics, classical Newtonian mechanics that you know, you know how you know how billiard balls behave. Like if you take a billiard ball and strike it on another billiard ball, you know how they behave. They behave very deterministically. Okay, if you know uh, that I have given this much of velocity to this billiard ball when it, hides, uh, when it hits this billiard ball, this is going to move in that way and this way. So these are very deterministic, this classical Newtonian mechanics. But this deterministic classical Newtonian mechanics does not work, uh, does not work uh, in the subatomic world with electrons and protons and atoms. And in fact, there were many experiments that uh, found uh, deviation in the subatomic world uh, from the prediction of classical Newtonian mechanics. And therefore, an entire new framework had to be developed to understand uh, this subatomic world. And that is this framework of quantum mechanics. And it turns out that without complex numbers, you cannot formulate quantum mechanics. It's I would not say impossible, but it's difficult to formulate quantum mechanics. And the entire quantum mechanics is formulated on complex numbers. So you see that this number system, which we thought of as you know totally absurd and useless beyond abstract mathematical world, actually is useful in, in a framework of quantum mechanics. There are many other physical theories where also complex numbers are useful. But I'm giving you this uh, example of quantum mechanics because it is one of the biggest discoveries of 20th century. Now you can say that, but how is this general theory of relativity or quantum mechanics even useful to us, for common people like us? How does it matter if general theory of relativity or quantum mechanics was even discovered or not discovered? Does it really matter to us? I would say that yes, it matters to you. So you have GPS in your phone with which you navigate in, around in the city Without Einstein's general theory of relativity, you could not, could not have had GPS in your phone, yes. And you could not have had that luxury of navigating around the city with, a, with your phone, the GPS in your phone. So yes, it matters to you. Without quantum mechanics, which would have been impossible if there was no complex numbers, we would not have, been pers we could not have perceived this idea of quantum computers which is going to revolutionize our technology. So yes, it matters to you. So you see how abstract mathematical concepts like pseudo Riemannian geometry or complex numbers turn out to be useful in developing technologies that is changing people's life. So with this, I would like to motivate some of the young minds in the audience uh, to take up you know, to plunge into this beautiful world of abstract mathematics and physical sciences and do something good for the society.
with this i would like to conclude thank you